So Judith and I decided to write this book because we were a little annoyed with the anemic discussion that passes for energy debate in this country. And uh, most of the real issues that, that are the drivers uh, and the hurdles are never discussed. So you see nice little uh, commercials on TV now from BP and Exxon. They're really cute and wonderful and everyone gets excited, but they actually never discuss the true issues that we have to deal with. Now the big issue, of course, is that we have a computer that won't go forward. Okay. We have two, the, the real problem, what's the problem? The problem is that we have two forms of energy. One power and the other transportation. Both are presently dominated by fossil fuels, but can be met with a realistic combination of fossil, renewable, and, and nuclear, and that's the, that's the key. It has to be realistic. Now, the pressing issues are the adverse effects in fossil fuels, so finally the public understands that there is a global issue in environmentally, whether you, you talk about global warming, which is just one issue, or you talk about pH drop in the ocean you know, as a result of CO2, it doesn't matter, there's lots and lots of issues. Um, and even, you know, mountaintop mining. But global warming, of course, caught the, the attention of, of the public. Um, now, coal is probably the worst thing. So coal, the use of coal, is arguably the most dangerous activity we have ever engaged in as a, as a species outside of large-scale war. So in the uh, 20th century, except for World War I and II, the use of coal and the upper, the upper respiratory effects of the use of coal has killed more people than anything else except World War I and II. Not usually discussed. The other thing that has come up is peak oil. Now, people talk about peak oil, but this peak coal, this peak gas, is peak anything. So half of what you have in the ground, you've used. Now, if you develop the unconventionals, which we won't talk about a lot, but you know, the heavy oils and the tar sands and the gas shales, then you'll push that peak out, but it, it won't go away. You have to peak. I mean, there's only so much in the ground. Whenever you get about half, the easy half, then you peak, and, and now it's more expensive. Now, I'd just like to talk, in, in, in terms of the public especially, the unit, kilowatt hours. I don't want to talk about anything else because you get, at the end of the month, a bill for electricity in kilowatt hours, and you pay 10 cents, approximately, per kilowatt hour. And everyone in the public knows that, and they understand that. So that's the unit you use because that's what counts. So again, it depends on where you live. We're a little bit cheaper than, than, than the average in, in, in New Mexico. Um, I can't remember what Washington State is, about nine. The Washington State is about the national average. All we care about is using an energy source to turn a dynamo. And that's, you know, again, the public not really sure exactly what goes on with, with energy. They know we need it. But they don't know that all we're doing is turning a dynamo. So it doesn't matter whether you're using wind to turn a rotor, to turn a turbine, or whether you're using falling water to turn a turbine, or whether you're heating water into steam, using anything, coal, gas, geothermal, nuclear, to turn a turbine, all you're doing is turning a turbine. Now, photovoltaic solar is the only thing that doesn't turn a turbine, but we realize that that's really more difficult than we want to do, so now we're going to concentrate solar that actually heats the fluid in that tube that turns a turbine. So again, we're turning a turbine. Now, I like these NASA shots because right away you see who has energy and who doesn't in the world. So you look at a, a spatial, distribution of, of, of energy, and we can see the industrialized world right there. This is about 10 years old, so it's a little, little out of date. These areas are a lot brighter, okay? Especially since China is bringing on coal-fired power plant every third day. So, yeah, so it's getting a little brighter, especially along the coast. Now, if you look at the energy distribution worldwide in terms of source, we're about two-thirds fossil fuel, and hydro and nuclear split the rest. It's been this way for 30 years. It's going to be this way for 30 more unless we do some pretty radical changes. It really depends on where you are. Of course, the U.S. about, again, two-thirds fossil fuel, um, a little bit more nuclear and a little bit less hydro, um, not much anything else. It depends on where you live. In New Mexico, where we are right now, it's all coal. Um, California is the most diversified. It's the most expensive. The European Union is a little bit better because of France, of course, which is 80% nuclear. Actually, it's 100% nuclear, but they choose to sell off 20% to Germany, uh, Spain, and England so they can meet their Kyoto protocols. India is like the rest of the world. So coal, you're all coal unless you have mountains and you have significant hydro. And that's pretty much it. Now the real problem here is transportation. It's all petroleum. And that's, that's the problem that we're facing right now, even though prices come down recently. Of course, the global economic crisis is not a good reason, uh, not a good mechanism for lowering gas prices. But we're stuck with that unless we come up with some alternatives. If you go away with anything else from this talk, the next few slides are in. This is the global, the 
global power consumption growth curve. It is steep, and it has nothing to do with the U.S. Absolutely nothing. So right now, we're at 15 trillion, a good round number. We're going to get to something, 30, 40, whatever, um, in kind of what do we actually need. But the, the, the U.S. is four, it'll grow maybe to five and a half, six. It's, it's not growing that fast. The rest of the world is growing because of these people. 1.6 billion people have no access to electricity whatsoever. 2.4 still burn wood manure as the main source of energy, and 3 billion more will be born by 2040. That's a lot of people needing a lot of energy. And the reason they need energy is because energy is the only thing that's ever tracked with quality of life in history. So whether you're a 17th century nobleman that is getting the equivalent of 3,100 kilowatt hours per year off the backs of indentured servants, slaves, and beasts of burden, doesn't matter, you can calculate that. In history, whenever you get above about 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year, you get into the good life area, okay? And the industrialized, sorry, the industrial revolution really raised about two billion people up above 0.8, and it's, I don't want to vilify fossil fuel, it's great, it's wonderful. It actually, it was in this room, which has at least 10,000 kilowatt hours per year, um, pretty much off the, off the back of fossil fuel. Your life is, your good life, our good life, is the result of fossil fuel, period. Now all these people down here don't have a lot of energy, and the strategy when dealing with the energy crisis is completely different. This group up here is way too much. We don't need that much. We can, we can drive hybrids, we can do plug-in electrics, we can replace our bulbs with compact fluorescence. All the things we think of as energy issues in this country, we can do and pull everyone back down there. Japan's done very well. In the last 10 years, they've cut their uses in half per person. So they're on, they're on the way down to where UK and France and Germany are, which should get down to about six. That's a, a very sustainable, very nice lifestyle. These people don't have any energy to conserve. So the strategy is completely different. And if we don't address that, we will miss the boat here because there's a lot more people down here. And all the problems are down here. War, terrorism, poverty is down here. It's not really up there. And it's not coincidental that that's the case. So what do we need? We need to get everyone into that area. That is just and sustainable. Okay? Get these people up to 3,000, get us down to 6,000, and it will actually be pretty good. So how much is that going to take? Well, get us down to 6,000, that sounds great. That's what everyone thinks about in this country is conserving energy, getting us down to some reasonable level. However, there's only a billion people in that subgroup. Not a lot, not a lot of effect, actually. Yeah, sure, we can say 4 trillion, that's great, but there's nothing compared to 40 trillion. All right, so again, that's not the issue. There's a lot of people already at 3,000, keep them there. It's these two groups, 7 billion. And you get them up so that they have a good life and they don't feel like engaging in war and terrorism, is going to take 21 trillion kilowatt hours. Now that's, you know, 30% more than we do worldwide now. That's the problem. That's the issue. So we need 30 trillion kilowatt hours. If you wanted kind of an idea where we should get to by 2040 or 2050, should be about 30 trillion kilowatt hours. 